This is a true crime podcast. It contains adult themes and content and may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. He said, you know what this is? I said, yeah, it's a razor blade. He said, I got you at my mercy, don't you? And here, they were guards and I was a convict. And that's the way it was. You knew where you were. I wish you would just learn to behave like ladies. And uh, he said, if you draw any blood, I'll kill every man in there. So the man dropped the knife and turned to the other men that were with him that he had set loose out of the very cells and said, well, he means it. He'll kill us if we don't give up. So they gave up. You do your own number. You do your own time. If you hear something, you keep it within yourself. If you see something, you're blind to it. I don't care if it's... If it's uh, a killing or uh, whatever, you just don't see it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our first proper live recording of Behind Gray Walls with Sky and I together Yay. at the old Idaho State Penitentiary. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, please, 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 before we even begin, grab a donut and a cookie. Those are all in the back. Help yourselves to a dessert. Uh, Sky, how's it going? It's good. I am so excited to be here and trying to like not just look at you because I'm a little. Uh, it's weird to have people in front of me. Yeah. So, uh, I'm normal as a historian. I don't deal with people very often. Yeah. So we'll see how this goes. Right. And most of our recordings are literally in a trench, yep. like underneath a World War One battle trench. A closet, like a broom closet. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, this is fun. This, this is, is exciting. exciting. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> All right. I think I think you're starting today. Am I? All right. I, I think so. Well. That's, at least that's how we plan the PowerPoint. So. I hope so. All right. So we are covering two prisoners today, and uh, I think we have some pretty exciting stories for you. Places that you've been. We've got uh, themes of war, divorce, forgery, kidnapping, conspiracy, murder, execution, and of course. Donuts. So that's how I'll wrap up my story today. Uh, But, you know, I've got two key individuals on both sides of the law that I'm going to talk about. And basically, after an execution that occurred here, just over here, beyond the two-yard gate, there's an execution that happened in 1951. And after that occurred, it brought these two men together. So I'll kind of go through that, that history. Both of these men, their names were Lavelle Angus Painter, and Delmar Theodore Swatzenbarg, they had similar life experiences, and we'll see kind of how their lives kind of wove together. So I'm actually going to start with Lavelle Painter. We don't actually have a photo of Lavelle, so he worked as a tower guard, so I just have a photo of a tower guard, and then you have Arjun Bright over here. Arjun Bright, he was later the captain. You're going to hear his name at the end of my section here, but that's kind of what the guards look like. And then in the middle, you have the, the head officers here, Warden Lou Clapp, who I covered quite extensively in the podcast, I'm a big fan, and Mark Maxwell, who we actually did a whole episode on last season. Lavelle Angus Painter was born on May 5th, 1905 in Florence, Colorado to Charles and Anna Painter. He had a younger brother named Wayne and a younger sister named Samira. The painters moved to Grandview, Idaho around 1910, which is about, it's south of Boise in Owyhee County, about half an hour, um, hour. It's like southwest of Mountain Home, west of the Bruno Dunes. And Lovell's mother actually died in 1918, so he would have been about 13 years old when she passed away. And I couldn't find much about what the Lovells were up to until mid-30s when some, some kids robbed his brother Wayne $30. So, and, and it mentioned that Wayne worked on a local farm. So a lot of farming down there and ranching. And so... It's likely that Lavelle probably had a similar job working on ranches and farms and just manual labor work. Lavelle's sister, Samira, she actually married a, a man named Marion Vanderford, and they had a son together named Chester. And Chester Vanderford actually was a guard here. And so we'll hear some oral history that was collected from him on June 25th, 1992. So he kind of weaves everything together. Now, their father, Charles, died suddenly. Lavelle's father died at the age of 68 in 1936 while working as a road construction foreman for the Oriana Civilian Conservation Corps near Murphy, Idaho, the CCC, which is a big Great Depression program that was going on. 
And I couldn't pin down what the painter children were up to in Grandview until October 1942 when Wayne enlisted into the United States Army. We have all those records and newspaper articles about that. Less than a year after that, December 7th attack on Pearl Harbor. And by the spring of 1943, Lavelle also joined. He followed his younger brother, joined the military. And he reported at Fort Douglas in Utah. And the brothers, it was often that they would split them up. And so Wayne actually went to Japan, he went to the Pacific, and Lavelle went to Europe. And in uh, September 1944, Lavelle was actually wounded on a battlefield in Germany. An artillery shell left shrapnel in his, in his arms. And so he went to the hospital. I found some articles about him being in the hospital until December 1944. In November, Wayne, acting as a scout for the 1st Cavalry Division of 19 men, actually led his troops into an intense and well-documented firefight. Wayne followed a trail and came upon these small fires and some rice and, and some bloody bandages. And he signaled that an enemy was in sight to his commanding officer, who spotted these, this sleeping Japanese soldier who apparently, quote, pulled the blanket off his face and saw us. He covered up again. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Wayne, this quote is kind of graphic. Wayne is quoted as saying, the Japs ran around like crazy people and made no effort to defend themselves. They just wanted to get out of there. Everyone was firing like mad and everyone must have bagged at least one or more. These are the words of these, you know, battle-hardened young men and they killed 41 Japanese that day. So this is the type of experience that our, you know, our boys were experiencing over and coming back and trying to reintegrate in a normal life. Now, Lavelle, he actually returned after, in late 1945. So he, he returned the army after a little stint in the hospital. He came back home and apparently he was just, just different. You know, a lot, of, a lot of men, we still experience that today. Fortunately, he had grown up in the same area as the warden, Lou Clapp, of the Idaho State Penitentiary. So when he started looking for a job, he found one pretty quickly. So here is his nephew, Chester Vanderford, talking about how he got a job at the prison in this June 25th, 1992 oral history. Can you remember why it was that you decided to apply to work out here? Why you came out? Well, at the the particular time getting out of the service, there wasn't any work. And I picked up a job as Garden City Police Department. And here's the catch. The warden, my mother, my dad, all went to school together from Grandview. And you got cliques in here. Anybody that was connected with the warden could go to work. Anybody was connected with Frank O'Neill from Salmon, they could get on. And it just goes down the line. And they got the same thing going on out here at the new one. But if you knew somebody, you could get a job. So I come out and I talked to him and I went to work the next day. That's all there was to it. <laughs> and what did you think about going to work at a prison? Did you, were you? Oh, I'd been in and out of here quite a bit before then because my uncle was one of the prison guards here until he died. Oh, oh, okay. He was from Grandview. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you see how it works. Yeah. I like yeah. his accent, his like salmon. <laughs> salmon, yeah. I was worried I was gonna start talking like him like after listening to this hour and a half of him with this long drawn out, like, yeah. I love it. So Lavelle was Chester's uncle, but when Chester arrived in 1953, Lavelle would no longer be employed at the institution. He kind of alluded to something occurring there. Chester only speaks about his uncle one other time in this whole oral history. And it might be surprising when you learn what happens later on. My uncle one time in here was sitting on one tower and a guy went over the wall here. Oh yeah? Nobody shot at him. They got up past the barn where he could see him. My uncle shot and took his ear off. I can't even tell you who that was. Hmm. Yeah, prisoner tried to escape and you've got a World War II sharpshooter on the tower, he takes off this prisoner's ear. And that is, that's an insane shot because your ears are not far <laughs> away from your head. That's... Apparently it stopped that's him right crazy. there. I don't think they, yeah. That's weird. I don't know why that would be. <laughs> so by all accounts, the bell painter, he was a guard you just didn't mess with. Like he was a sharpshooter, 
with this, all of this experience, and he was kind of just quiet and distant. He never had, he was never married, he never had kids or anything else like that. So we'll get more on his personality in just a bit. Now I'm gonna talk about Mr. Delmar Swatzenberg. So he is our second subject. He was born on October 29th, 1919 in Mount Vernon, Missouri, to George Swatzenberg and Gwyneth Talley. And his parents, they divorced when he was 11, around 1930, and Delmar later noted to authorities that he actually lived between both parents' houses and didn't have a, quote, happy or normal childhood, basically bouncing back and forth between the two. He left home at the age of 15, and he joined the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the work brought him to Idaho around 1936, which was the time when Lavelle's father had died while he was working on roads in southern Idaho. Delmar actually noted that he learned to drive a bulldozer, so maybe they were connected in some way there, I don't know. But Delmar actually got into the nightlife and he was working as a car dealer and gambler at the baseball cigar store in Pocatello. Probably brought about his first run in with the law in the summer of 1938. So Delmar committed a burglary at the Pocatello house, stealing a pair of trousers valued at $6.50 from a man living at this house. So Sky, oh, it's our favorite game. It's our favorite game. It's 1938. Ooh. What what would $6.50 be today? Um, I'm actually really bad at this game. Um, <laughs> we both are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 1938 and mm-hmm. 650. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, I would say like 50 bucks. $125.25. What kind of pants cents. are these? I know, that's what I said. <laughs> that's all of my <laughs> wardrobe combined. Are they, combined. Like, yeah. they silk pants? Like, why do they cost so much? I don't know. The uh, guy was very Well, upset, I guess though. I don't blame him then. They seem like nice pants. <laughs> yeah. So he was convicted on August 8th, 1938, and sentenced six months in the county jail for this in Pocatello. But he was released a month later on September 22nd seemed that he learned his lesson, and he had a girlfriend, Dorothy Ray, and in November, 20-year-old Delmar and 16-year-old Dorothy were married. Sounds, sounds weird now, but it was fairly normal That's back normal. then. Yeah. He enlisted in the National Guard, and on April 1st, 1941, he enlisted into the United States Army, months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. On December 1st, 1941, this is just a few months after he enlists, he was convicted after attempting to forge a $10 check. The judge fortunately withheld his sentence. They put him on a five-year probation, and withheld sentence basically says, if you stay out of trouble for five years, you come back to this courthouse, we'll erase that from your record. But if you get in trouble, you're gonna spend your time in the Mm -hmm. penitentiary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably this was partly because, you know, Six days after that Pearl Harbor occurred, he knew he was in the military and he would be uh, under a good jurisdiction for the next couple Mm -hmm. years anyway. So Delmar actually served overseas in the European front as a field artilleryman and received two battle stars. He stated he served in northern France and received a campaign ribbon for that. Uh, He did go AWOL and he actually had several infractions that I was like, oh. Seriously? Uh, He spent three months locked down in a guardhouse and lost two-thirds of his wages for that period. In December 1944, the month that Lavelle Painter was actually released from the military hospital from that shrapnel, Delmar went to the military hospital for some strange muscle disease. And so they could have crossed paths, these two Idaho enlistments, like they could have possibly been involved or crossed paths in that little time period. Of course, we'll never know. Delmar received an honorable discharge from the Army on October 10th, 1945, and it appears he stayed out of trouble. He moved on to a new job, actually working at Yellowstone as a park ranger, which seemed like good service, you know, he was working hard on all that. It was nice and calm, and uh, he started to struggle with money, which was being spent on things other than his wife and children. Uh. Um, I forgot to mention... Oh. He had three children at this point with Dorothy, so... Oh, I thought you were going to mention something bad. I oh, thought you were yes. going to be like, oh, well, I forgot to mention that, like, definitely don't have your kids listen to this. So, three kids is... That's good for him, yeah. I guess. So his, But his, not that he's not great that he's not spending money on them. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. He, he was, you know, going to those gambling halls. Yep. Ah, gets you in a little bit of trouble. Yeah. And so, you know, to pay for this habit, he's mm-hmm. got to find something. So he got a job. He's working as a truck driver for the Idaho Refining Company establishment in Pocatello. And all these forged checks started to appear in the area. 
And he was arrested in Blackfoot on September 26, 1947 for questioning. Authorities were on to him, and it turns out he had stolen a check from his work for $212 and forged the name on the back and collected the money from a local business. And seeing how easy this scheme was, he actually kept going back to work and stealing other people's checks, oh, cashing gosh. them, $925 oh, worth. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so today's money, that's about it, a little over $11,000. Jeez, so, that's wow. a lot of money. Right. So he's arrested and officially charged on October 14th, 1947 uh, for forgery and sentenced to 14 years as number 7241. Now, uh, on the form from the prosecuting attorney when asked the character of Delmar's associates, the prosecutor wrote that Delmar was, quote, addicted to gambling and drinking and asked where his criminal tendencies came from. It was uh, basically a loss of impulse control. and. Delmar admitted that, uh, you know, he, quote, wouldn't have done it if I had been sober, end mm. quote. So now he's drinking, he's gambling, he's getting himself in trouble. He ended up working actually as a dishwasher over here in the dining hall. And his first incarceration was less than a year. He was released on parole on September 15th, 1948. And he returned home to Pocatello to his wife and his kids. Now, he got a job at the Patton and Linton in Pocatello where he was hauling gravel and tried to make ends meet by getting another job at the Blair Fry Motor Company where he was transporting cars. And it seems that the stress of, you know, all, these, all this work and this lack of impulse control got the better of him. And according to Delmar, quote, on March 1st, 1949, a check in the amount of about $85 was cashed at the OK store in Pocatello, Idaho. I did not cash the check but the clerk in the store identified me as being the one who did cash the check, end quote. He sat in the jail for, with a $2,000 bond, which he couldn't afford, and I have several newspaper articles of him just pleading with the judge to reduce it to 1000 so he could be released and go to work and work for his kids. And mm. uh, of course, he was intoxicated at the time he forged this $85 check. And so he was convicted July 18th, 1949, and uh, transported to the prison with a new inmate number, number 7690. So you can kind of see where we get a lot of this information, the basics about their life and their incarceration. So his intake, Delmar Theodore Swassenbarg, number 7690, crime, forgery, sentence, 14 years. Sentenced on July 18th, 1949, received August 5th, 1949 from Bannock County. Pled not guilty, religion, Protestant, Eighth grade education, which he received in Seneca, Missouri. He was married to Dorothy Swatzenberg and had three children, Delmar Jr., James, and Paul. His eyes were brown. His hair was dark brown. He was five foot, eight inches tall, 150 pounds, had medium complexion, no deformities or tattoos. He lived in Idaho for 13 years. He was circumcised mm -hmm. and vaccinated. He occasionally drank alcohol and <laughs> smoked, but he didn't gamble do dope and was not a communist which was oh see ever since i found that it's so fascinating I'm seeing it everywhere i wonder now. if anyone has ever said yes because who would be like actually it's what one year is it yes oh. i'm gonna say yes i am a communist like <laughs> we are that, gonna have to find that's this. never been never been a good thing in this country <laughs> no uh Eliza's father george is deceased and his mother gwyneth tally is living in aurora missouri and his Bertillion, which is like this little naked figurine, they draw all the deformities and things. He had a scar between his brow, he had false teeth, and scars on his right inner arm and right knee. Now, again, Delmar seemed to have an easy time in the institution. His file contained letters from family members and businesses that had hired him. They said, no, we'll take him back. He's a great worker. He just he has issues, and, and we understand that. We'll help him through it. A telegram actually arrived on September 13th, 1950, saying that his mother in Missouri was ill mm -hmm. and not expected to live. And that day, the pardon board and the governor signed a form releasing him, sending him on a reprieve so he could go to Missouri and visit his mom one last mm -hmm. time in return, which, you know, it's kind of a testament to someone who is a trustee, someone you can, you can depend on. He returned, no issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't find if his mother died or, or any more information about it, which was kind of interesting. In March 1951, Dorothy files for divorce from Delmar. Why? <laughs> Good question. So I, I wonder why. why. <laughs> that seems weird. That, that spring was rough. So March 1951, Dorothy files for divorce. A month later, Friday, April 13th, 1951, Idaho held the first double execution in our history. 
21-year-old Troy Powell and 20-year-old Ernest Walrath were brought from the death row cells in the 1890 cell house all the way back to this corner behind this gate over here into Two Yard and hanged for their crime. Um, they had brutally murdered a elderly grocer just a few blocks from the prison over here in this neighborhood. If you've been to the Roosevelt Market, it was kind of around the corner from that. It's in that same neighborhood and he ran a grocery. He was actually neighbors with Troy Powell. And mm. yeah, and Troy thought that they could get this scheme over him and it just turned, turned wrong. They ended up beating him in the head with a sap, hitting him in the head with a gun. And then Troy was rooting through things and he turned around and Walrath, uh, the guy on the right there, was plunging a knife into this unconscious old man's back. So, yeah. So they're convicted and they're sentenced. And, you know, there were a lot of murders and, and grocery store robberies that ended in murder mm -hmm. like this, uh, that occurred at this time. And these men, they got life sentences. So why were these young men executed? The idea uh, was to basically send a message to mm -hmm. the young criminals, like these two were gonna be an example for future young criminals. <laughs> Uh, so, that's just a that's a that's a tough lesson for mm -hmm. others to learn for those two guys. Right. I mean, yeah. And it and it has an impact on the prisoners serving time in the institution. Like you can imagine, like you know that, you know, brother that could have been you is going to be hanged just outside here. So we actually have an oral history with Mark Maxwell, who I showed earlier, the vice uh, warden. He was uh, later warden, and he talks about the. Uh, the impact of execution on the prison population. You mentioned to me on the phone the other day that um, you thought that it had been a mistake to build the gallows inside the yard because of the other inmates. Can you tell me something about that? I can't explain uh, really what the, what the reaction is of inmates. They, they become uh, very quiet. Um, sullen for a day or two after the execution. It has a real impact on them, there is no doubt in my mind. I don't know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good deterrent and maybe something for inmates to see. You take in Idaho, um, we probably had four to five hundred inmates here when Snowden was executed and we probably had two to three hundred here when Wallace and Powell was executed. So all the rest of the ex all the rest of the inmates that went through the institution they never they never saw an execution. But I, I'll bet that I'll bet you that those inmates that were here in the institution during an execution uh, it had an impression on them that uh, maybe uh, still with them to some extent maybe they don't think about it anymore. But it, it had a it had an, uh, an impression on them. I'm sure. Yeah. I'll bet the, those inmates that were here in the institution during an execution it had an impression on them that maybe is still with them to some extent. Maybe they don't think about it anymore, but it had an impression on them, I'm sure. Like, well, I mean, they have impressions on me, and, you know, we're years and years, decades removed, mm -hmm. and that's, I mean, to know that this execution was to teach others a lesson is like, mm -hmm. that affects me, you know, right. it, yeah. executions are just... <sighs> Ugh, they're tough. Yeah. So Delmar, about 10 years older than these two men, he would have, you know, had this fresh on his mind when he was released a month after this execution mm -hmm. on May 15th, 1951. And he scrambled to pick up his life again, you know, returning to Pocatello. He worked at the railroad, and he became a car salesman for a short time. And a year later, Lavelle Painter and Delmar Swatzenbarg, their paths would cross on Sunday, January 13th, 1952. Um, they both frequented bars, you know, they both were drinkers, and the guard, Lavelle Painter, would often get intoxicated and show something off to fellows at the bar. What? I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Let's let Mark okay. Maxwell explain. <laughs> when we did the all work in power, I wasn't here, but I've heard the stories that, that they pulled a pin to set the trap. Now, this down here has the lever on it, and, and, uh, and he did the lever work, but Clapp insisted that he do it. Now, I think his assistant did it. The, the apprentice did the push the lever, but Clapp insisted that they do it because they, when uh, Walworth and Powell, there was a guard here, and he wanted to pull the pin. He wanted to be the one who pulled the pin, and he did. 
and uh, then he took the pen and he'd go downtown afterwards and go in the bars and say, here, they'd get drunk and he'd say, here's the pen that I pulled when Walter and Powell were executed. I guess it was the same pen. I don't know. Probably would have been. Well, it, he finally went berserk and ended up over at Blackfoot and finally died. And they contributed his death mainly to the psychological reaction of that, of that uh, execution out here. Who? Who? The guard. The guard? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. You don't know who that would have been. <laughs> That was before my time. Yeah, He'd gone. That's fine. But it was in the papers. There was some stuff. There's some newspapers accounts of that. I'll bet you Mrs. Clapp might know who that guard was. Uh, Jerry, my, the boy. So what he was saying is that this guard, he was the one who wanted to pull the pin for Walrath and Powell during their execution. And he took that pin home and he would go out and drink and show it off to people. Could be a problem. Yeah, I really like that. Right. That's uh, not great. A little uh, pretty morbid. And, you know, part of our collection, we actually have the hoods and rope from mm. the execution of Walrath and Powell. So, <sighs> also just like, ah, do we need this? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, on Sunday, January 13th, 1952, at 4.45 p.m., Delmar was in Boise from Pocatello. He was intoxicated. It's four in the afternoon, like, he saw the guard Lavelle Painter hail a cab on the corner of 8th and Main Street, and as Lavelle hopped into the cab, Delmar pushed his way in with the gun drawn. The cabbie asked him where they wanted to go, and not realizing it, and Swassenberg said to Idaho City. The cabbie uh, picked up his radio to call the cab dispatcher to say where they were going, and Delmar put his 32 automatic to the back of his head and said, put it down. Lavelle reached for his police whistle on his belt, and Delmar stopped him, saying, Blow that, and I'll blow your guts out right here. He followed up by demanding Lavelle to empty his pocket, saying, quote, you won't need any money where you're going. After I kill you, I'm going to shake you down and see if you have any more money, end quote. Now, the cab driver took Main Street to Warm Springs Avenue, drove up into the foothills on Highland Valley Road, which is off of East Warm Springs Avenue, just past East Junior High in the Shakespeare Festival area, and they drove into the foothills until the car actually got stuck in mud. So Delmar told Lavelle to say his prayers, and Lavelle actually put his face down, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and Delmar actually interrupted, and he said, that's enough, and he put the gun to Lavelle's head, and the cabbie interjected, he said, if you're going to kill this guy, don't do it here and mess up my cab. Oh my gosh. I know, I couldn't believe this. <laughs> Take him out in the sagebrush somewhere, and you know, Delmar, is, he's drunk, and so he's like, okay, and he turns. <laughs> And he actually opens up the car door, and that gives uh, Lavelle just enough time to push him out of the car and land on him outside in the mud. During this fracas, Delmar puts the gun behind him and fires, and he misses. The gun's jammed, it's full of, of mud, and they, they actually roll and tumble, they're fighting, and they actually roll down a 40-foot embankment. Lavelle actually picks up a rock, and he slams it against Delmar's head four or five times, Jeez. knocking him out. The cabbie ran down, he grabbed the gun, he cleaned it out, he put a new round in the chamber, he cocked it, he pointed it at Delmar while Lavelle actually took some handkerchiefs and hogtied him. And they carried him, his unconscious body, to the cab, they drove him to the sheriff, and when he finally came to, they asked, you know, Delmar, why would you do this? Why would you kidnap a prison guard? What was your thinking? He killed my buddies, is what he told them. Um, um, yeah. Oof. So... I'll get back to Delmar in just a moment, but... I do, I do oh, have a question yes. about yeah. the cabbie. Do, mm -hmm. What do we know about him? Because he just had no fear all at the, all. Yeah. Like, I wish I had left the newspaper articles because he, he saved the day. And, yeah. like, and it says, like, cabbie's, you know, old-timey, I can't remember what it was, but, like, sly thinking yeah. saves the day. Was, and, was it, yeah. like, was he, did he think that, saying, like, oh, do it out there that's going to give him an, an opportunity to overtake him? Or was he genuinely, yeah. like, not in my cab? I, you know, I think it was probably a mix. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I had a cab, I, that would I would be probably. A mess. 
Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So the prison guard Lavelle, he actually took some time off work from the penitentiary, obviously. Thanks. And uh, he started to frequent bars again. Oh. And four months after the incident, on May 28th, 1952, police officers had to show up to a bar and take his prison instituted revolver from him because he's waving it around oh, in the middle goodness. of this bar. And he had to take it back to L Warden Lou Claps. So the next day, he takes it back and he says, Warden, here's my, here's my gun and here's my badge. I'm resigning. So he quit. He leaves the prison on May 29th, 1952, and he goes downtown and he sees Arjun Bright, that officer I had on the, on the slide earlier. And he holds him up with a rifle. And Arjun Bright's like, whoa, 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 you're one of my guards, like what's going on? And He's just saying really unintelligible stuff. And finally, Archer Bright like, calms him down when he promises that he'll meet him at the bar at 7 o'clock that night. Minutes later, Lavelle takes this, uh, this rifle to the Veltech station on 5th and Main Street right there in downtown. And he demands that the attendant call the FBI to verify that he, Lavelle Painter, was an FBI agent. And this attendant that he calls, and he speaks to this FBI agent, and he, he's like, this man's holding me up and he's telling me to ask you if he's an FBI agent. I, it's, it's, I don't know. And he, the got FBI, through, he got through to the FB, FBI? Did. Yes, he did. <laughs> and so the FBI on the other line, they're calling the Boise Police Department who show up and arrest Lavelle. Huh. And, you know, something was off with him. Uh, he was actually sent to State Hospital South in Blackfoot because he was acting just so strange and delirious. He lived about a week. He suddenly died while in Blackfoot on wow. June 5th, 1952. And there didn't seem to be anything physically wrong with him. And so huh. they did an autopsy and they revealed that he had a bleeding ulcer that probably caused his death. Oh. Um, like it was causing toxicity that was oh, affecting his mind. That makes sense. And it may have all been spurred from this, you know, all this mm. anguish, pressure, everything else from this attack from Delmar. It was rumored, as we heard from Mark Maxwell, that, quote, they contributed his death mainly to the psychological reaction of the execution out here. Mm. So, you know, his connection to pulling the pin and then being attacked for being the guy pulling the pin and then showing off the pin and everything else. Uh, so back to Delmar. He was returned to the Idaho State Penitentiary, obviously, uh, but for robbery. They could get him for 25 years on robbery, and uh, it was a little bit higher charge than for kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And so he pled guilty, of course, and entered this, the penitentiary a three-time loser on February 13th, 1952, at the age of 32. And again, he was a model prisoner. He only had one minor write-up while he was here. He had a, a lack of interest and cooperation as the head cook at the dining hall. And so he was actually given a new job. First, he worked at the tag plant, the license plate factory where the prisoners were making those, and the print shop after that as a cell house janitor and in the prison bakery where he worked as a pastry chef in the late 1958 and 1959. Now, this is where things get strange again. So Lavelle's nephew, Chester Vanderford, actually helped establish the bakery and oversaw the prisoners here. And so here's another clip about some of the shenanigans that he had to deal with as the the guard over the, the prison bakery. The bakery, that was, they bought uh, the ovens from Albertsons, and he come out with recipes and bread and donuts and all this stuff, and they made all that in the bakery. We made fruitcake. Oh. And there ain't no place under God's given earth in this place to hide it, to keep people out of it. And I come out and I started the, uh, underneath the gallows <laughs> and there was nobody who could go down there. So we had it for Christmas, otherwise it had been gone. <laughs> I caught one guy in there that I remember, sack full of donuts. I chased him clear down to the showers. Caught him. Every time somebody eats a donut, some con wouldn't get a donut. Because, boy, it was right right to the line on everything, and I made him sit, sit down and eat a whole big pan of donuts until he was almost sick, and then I took him to the hole. And locked him up. <laughs> yeah. So you, you heard all of that? You know, he, he had to make, he made some, uh, some Christmas, like, pies and had to hide them underneath the gallows. 
so that nobody would touch him. And then some some con was stealing donuts, and he forced him to eat a whole pan of them, so he got oh. sick and then tossed him in solitary. Now, interestingly, we actually have a photo of Delmar making donuts out here. I When I found all these connections, it was just like, oh, I can't even believe this. Uh, so please, I picked up donuts at Albertsons today, <laughs> literally specifically from Albertsons. Help yourselves. <laughs> He was released on parole for this charge on August 12th, 1959. And he received his final discharge from the prison on April 5th, 1961 with the note, quote, subjects conduct work record and attitude while incarcerated as an inmate at this institution were satisfactory, end quote. Now I found his obituary and learned that after his release, he remarried and moved to Seaview, Washington. And he worked in various uh, construction companies. He joined the Episcopal Church. He had been Baptist and before that, and uh, the Disabled American Veterans. And he enjoyed tinkering with electronics. Uh, he died at the age of 73 on February 17, 1993. And that is Delmar Swatzenberg and Lavelle Painter, just this strange connection, these two's lives kind of interwoven like a, what are those donuts called? Oh. <laughs> A twist, yeah, like a twist, there we go. But nice, bring it back to yeah. donuts. You know what's really weird? So while I was buying donuts today, uh, my cashier, she was like, oh, you must have something sweet going on tonight. I was like, well, and so I explained, I was like, oh, I'm doing a little presentation about the penitentiary, uh, and one of the prisoners worked as a, as a baker out here. And she's like, you know what? My uncle served time out there. And I was like, what was he in for? murder like, <laughs> so i gave her my card and i said let me know if you want to talk we should do this <laughs> so, like i can't believe this is so wild <laughs> small world it's such a small world there's so many people connected this place well, all right scott nice work well thank you <laughs> thank you in 2021, the Idaho State Historical Society is celebrating 140 years of service to Idahoans as the trusted source in protecting Idaho's historical places and artifacts and sharing its stories. As a part of the commemoration, the Old Idaho Penitentiary is committed to bringing you 140 unique stories about the people who worked, lived, and served time at the site through this podcast and the events and programs scheduled throughout the year. Capturing 140 Storytelling Program offers a unique glimpse at lives filled with hope and despair and the enduring triumphs and tragedies at Idaho's only penitentiary from 1872 to 1973. Stay tuned. for us today, Sky. Well, I didn't bring donuts, so already not as exciting as your story. Um, no, you brought cookies, I thought. Yeah, yeah, I brought cookies. Yeah. Um, also, did you want to read your sources real quickly? Oh, I noticed at the top I, you didn't do that. I always forget. Okay, sources, the inmate file from the Idaho State Archives, the photo collection through the Idaho State Archives and Ancestry.com that you saw here, and Idaho Daily Statesman through the Boise Public Library, newspapers.com, ancestry.com, and the Marshall Public Library, which has a digitized collection of the Pocatello Tribune, which had all the juicy details about his crimes. So. Awesome. Um, so I am doing um, Bonnie Jean Deaton. And um, so my sources are Inmate File, uh, Ancestry.com Records, Newspapers.com, Idaho Daily Statesman articles, Soda Springs, uh, Idaho.com, an article called Picturing History, Soda Springs, Idaho by Kenneth Mays from the Deseret News, SodaChamber.com, and an article uh, from Beer Springs to Soda Springs from KTVB.com, and then just some brief Wikipedia stuff. So Wait, um, there's a beer springs? Well, so I'll get into <laughs> oh that. My God. We're, we'll talk about it. No, I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> um, so before we get into the beer springs, though, sorry, we have to okay. we have to get into some other stuff. So Bonnie Deaton was actually born Bonnie Jean Kloppel on August 7th, 1931 to Otto and Rose Stark John Kloppel. She was five of seven kids. She had um, older brothers Morris, Dwayne, and Dean, an older sister Donna May, a younger brother Glenn, and a younger sister Arlene. 
She was born in White River, South Dakota, and her family actually hailed from Nebraska. They moved to South Dakota in February 1931, just before her birth. And that was because her father owned land and he moved out there to work corn and wheat. But this is both Great Depression and Dust Bowl conditions. So by 1934, things in South Dakota are not going well. And so this, he spoke to a, a reporter from the Colfax County Call from Schuyler, Nebraska, um, and he stated that conditions in South Dakota were, quote, beyond description, end quote. So between September 1933 and August 1934, the family moved from White Rock, South Dakota to Crookston, Nebraska. Now these two areas are really only about 50 miles apart, so it seems that he moved his family back to Nebraska, and then he would kind of move back and forth between the farm in South Dakota and uh, Nebraska where his family was. And then in 1939, the family moved another 45 miles southeast to Johnstown, Nebraska, and that is where Bonnie spent most of her adolescence. Now Bonnie did really well at school. She even made it into the newspaper a couple times for what they called diligence. Um, so from the Long Pine Journal, uh, February 22nd, 1940, it reported that she had been, quote, neither tardy nor absent for the past two months and a half. And she would have been about fifth grade. And so when you're fifth grade, I think it's kind of impressive that like you want to go to school. Um, <laughs> and then uh, in 1942, when she was about in seventh grade from the Ainsworth Star Journal, it said, quote, um, this is actually, um, she joined a club. And this is actually a quote from the, the people in the club itself that says, quote, we organized our club for the coming year. As we have nine members, we named it the Climbing Nine. We plan to have hobbies and to work for the betterment of our school. We have committees for the reading corner, washing unit, and health inspector, end quote. Um, and Bonnie was actually named news reporter for that club. So um, she's well known in the area. She's doing really well. Um, her name was also listed in the Brown County Democrat for her eighth grade graduation. And then she attended Ainsworth High School and by all accounts was well known, did well. Um, and I actually have her high school, oh, that's the wrong way. This is uh, her high school uh, photograph from 1949. And this is actually about the time that uh, right after the summer of 1948, um, which was between her junior and senior year, and that was when tragedy struck. Um, so, f on July 12, 1948, several Nebraska newspapers reported on an accident in which Bonnie was involved, and this is from the Lincoln Journal Star, quote, Dale Bollich, 16, son of Mr. and Mrs. Leo Bollich, was killed and two other persons injured when their car went out of control on a curb on Highway 7 south of Ainsworth. Injured were Harley Gaskins, 20, and Bonnie Kloppel, 16, the driver of the car. Both were reported in fair condition at an Ainsworth hospital, end quote. And the Nebraska State Journal actually added that she had been taking the two men to work um, when she uh, basically just lost control of the car going around a curve too fast and ended up killing um, one of her friends. So the Rock County leader from Bassett, Nebraska, reported three days later that Harley Gaskins was still reported as unconscious, but the Nebraska State Journal had stated he just had had a concussion. Um, but Bonnie herself had had severe cuts. There there were several articles on that. This obviously was a very traumatic event. But despite this, she graduated from Ainsworth High School and then immediately married Harley Gaskins, with whom she had been in the accident uh, the year before. Uh, after their marriage, they moved to Rupert, Idaho for farming, and their first son, Stephen, was born in May 1950. Their daughter, Connie, was born in 1951, and then their second son, Jerry, was actually born two years later, about 1953. Now, Harley apparently did not have the best of luck with driving, uh, because in May 1952, the Times News from Twin Falls reported that he was in another car accident, and he had actually stopped by the side of the road to talk to someone, and another man had run into the back of his car. Um, no one was hurt. Um, and then actually later, in, in 1969, he was arrested for driving while intoxicated. Um, that isn't really part of the story. I just thought that he just was kind of always in the news for like being in issues with cars. So, so then, by um, 1959, the family moved 130 miles east to Soda Springs, Idaho. And I'm not completely sure why. They may have found maybe some good ranching land, but the area itself isn't really known for like farming or mining in the way that like a lot of, you know, other places around the state are. So probably to help supplement some income, Bonnie took a job waitressing at the Idaho Cafe in Soda Springs. And she worked there for three years until 1962, and then she took another job at another dining house and lounge in Soda Springs. And then the Idaho State Journal reported on October 16th, 1963, that a divorce had been granted to Bonnie from Harley Gaskins, but the reason for the divorce were not listed in the newspaper. 
After their divorce, it seems that their children went to live with some of Bonnie's siblings, and I couldn't tell if the, that move happened before or after her crime. When she came into the prison, her oldest son was living in South Dakota with one of her brothers, and her daughter and younger son lived in Nebraska with some other siblings. And I, I don't know why. Their, their father, I believe, moved down to Utah, and so I don't know if he just didn't want to take care of them. I don't know what the deal was there. But in November 1963, so this is really about a month after her divorce was finalized, she married a man named Thomas Blaine Deaton in Nevada. Thomas was in the Army during World War II. He actually wasn't able to enlist until 1944, so I'm not sure if he served or for how long he served, but he was, he did, had his, his little Army card. I can't talk today. And he was five years Bonnie's senior, and he was actually born and raised in Soda Springs, and he actually owned what was called the B&B, or sometimes they called it the Double B Lounge. And so when Bonnie married Thomas, obviously she's not going to work at another, you know, lounge, so she started to work for him, and she became part owner as well. Um, And things in her life were fairly settled for the next three years, but she admitted that around 1964, she started drinking fairly heavily. Um, So it's something that our two two, uh, inmates have in common. And so that up to that point, up to 1964, she, quote, had never drank prior to about two years, except sometimes an occasional drink once in a while, end quote. And her drinking would soon get her into trouble. So we'll pause here. We'll talk about Soda Springs. I don't know if you guys find all of this, like, background information interesting, but I find it always really interesting. Um, and Soda Springs actually is something I didn't, a place I've never known anything about. Have you ever been? I don't think so. Okay, no. great. Well, let's find out uh, some interesting things. So Soda Springs is the county seat of Caribou County, which is one of the southeasternmost counties in the state. Um, it's less than 50 miles from the Wyoming border, and it is very nearby the uh, current Fort Hall Reservation. So the area would have historically been home to Shoshone and Bannock tribes. Um, in the early 1800s, the area around current-day Soda Springs was an important stop on the Oregon Trail. And uh, it was well known for mineral springs, and so travelers often stopped to bathe there and to basically get water for their journey further west. And it actually gained the nickname the Oregon Trail Oasis because of that. Here's the information that you're interested in. So fur traders supposedly tasted the waters of one of the springs and stated that it, quote, tasted like beer, flat beer. Um, So actually, the, the area was originally called Beer Springs. That's... Really and then, fun. in 1870, uh, the LDS President Brigham Young established the current day site of Soda Springs, um, as well as a summer home for himself. And that may be part of why it's no longer called Beer Springs. Um, <laughs> I don't think he drank beer very often. Oh, uh, yeah. And he actually, when he, he created the settlement, he saw it as part of this larger vision of what, what was called the State of Deseret. And this was this idea that was basically, he, they were going to create a bunch of self-sustaining colonies that had sort of strategic economic economic and defensive capabilities. And so that way they would, as, a, as the church, as they built up this state of Deseret, they would have all of these strongholds kind of everywhere. Um, but obviously that never came to be. But the, he spent a lot of time in Soda Springs, and there's quite a bit uh, of an LDS outcropping out there because I, of that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in the 1880s, W.H. Hooper, who was Salt Lake City's leading banker and a Utah delegate to Congress, he also had a summer home there. And he began a national marketing campaign for both Soda Springs, the city, and its soda water industry. Mm-hmm. And that is part of Again, why the name was changed. That, that's also part of why Beer Springs became... They actually, have, there's a, a larger spring area that's called Hooper Springs because of him, in tribute to him. So when Caribou County was created in 1919, Soda Springs was the largest city in the area, so it became the county seat. Then, in 1937, founders of the town were drilling for a well to provide hot water for a bathhouse, and they accidentally hit a carbon dioxide chamber 315 feet underground, and that unleashed what has become known as the geyser, which shot up in a column at least 70 feet high. And that um, is what it looks like. Um, And so they kind of, I mean, it happened, it was an accident, they kind of didn't know what to do, how to fix it. So um, after several weeks of just flowing freely, it ended up flooding the downtown area, and they were like, I guess maybe we should do something about this. And so they were then able to figure out how to cap it. And so sodaspringsid.com states that the geyser is the only, what they call captive, uh, regulated geyser in the world. Um, And so it becomes a tourist attraction because they were able to put a time release valve on the geyser. And so it releases once every hour on 
on the hour. And so you can depend on going, when you go to Soda Springs, it's not like uh, in you know the, the more Yellow natural stones, geysers yeah. where you just have to like hope that it goes mm -hmm. off when you're there. Yeah. You know it's gonna go off at that time. Wow. Um, this is an interesting little fact though. A few weeks after they had capped it, the Soda Springs city received a telegram from the Secretary of the, of the Interior asking them them to turn the geyser off because, quote, it is throwing the world famous old faithful geyser off schedule, ah. end quote. So, wow. <laughs> so that's, but that's how, you know, you can see how powerful it is, how big of a, of a geyser that is. So at Hooper Spring Park in Soda Springs, they have, quote, free, clear, sparkling soda water available, end quote. Now, the website doesn't make it clear, but I like to imagine that it's from the water fountains. <laughs> I don't know if they have it bottled and you can just pick it up at like Everywhere a park. You, go, you yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of soda water. I just like if I'm gonna have carbonation, I just need sugar in it. I just, you know, you know like, like people with soda, uh, what are those soda streams? Oh, yeah, things? yeah, yeah. Like they're just so crazy about those. Yeah. Like I could just see them like running out there and like trying to cap it all. Yeah. 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 Can you like, just, this is it. Do you know, can you just drink it naturally or do you have to like filter it? I don't, well, like I said, I think, um, I don't. I would imagine if it tastes like beer, it probably doesn't taste super great, but I've. <laughs> That's a well, good question. Uh, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Soda Springs has never really had a big population. Its peak population was in 1980 at about 4,051 people. And the most recent estimate would be about 3,000 people is all. So probably in 1966, I kind of tried to average what was the population in 60 and 70. It was probably around 2,600 or so. And that's when things are happening with Bonnie. So back to Bonnie. So again, since the town was so small, it seems likely that the Double B Lounge probably had several local regulars and was well known and fairly popular. Um, it had open, been open for at least five years before we're at this point uh, in 1966. So on July 28th, 1966, Bonnie and Thomas go to a party in town and they do some drinking there. When the party's done, they go back to the Double B. It's about 2 a.m. And John Hoekstra, who he cleaned the taverns after everything was closed, he was there cleaning up. And according to Bonnie's statement, Thomas was mad at her, but she didn't say the reason why. And she went behind the bar to the cash register to get a dime to make a phone call. And she said that both John and Thomas were standing behind the bar as well. And then according to her statement, she says that suddenly John is calling her name. And she says he was standing in front of her and her husband was lying on the ground in a pool of blood. And, and this is her own words, quote, I don't remember getting the gun as I am scared of a gun at any time. I never did see the gun. I was told my husband was shot in the side of the head. I never seen where he was shot. I remember one distant noise that was apparently the shot. After shooting, I did have the gun in my hand, end quote. So once she realizes that Thomas was shot, and apparently she was the one who did it, she first runs to the phone and calls the operator and asks them to send help. But it's 2 a.m. in Soda Springs, Idaho. So there's not, like, the policemen are probably all asleep. Right. If there's an operator, they're probably, were sleeping themselves, frankly. So when no one comes after a few minutes, she runs to the police station. But again, no one is there because it's 2 a.m. So when no one is at the police station, she then runs to another cafe and asks the owner there to get help. So she finally makes her way back to the tavern and the police are already there. And an ambulance comes, takes Thomas, and she is taken to jail. And John Hoekstra and another man named Les White, and I couldn't figure out what his connection was, why he was also arrested, but they were arrested and taken to jail. And then of course, Hoekstra and White would eventually be released because they had no connection to this crime. And this is what she said of the motivation, quote, I did not make any plans to shoot my husband. We were not getting along too well. We int intended to sell the bar and both my husband and I talked about going back to Nebraska. Neither of us had ever threatened to shoot each other. I feel if I had not been drinking, this never would have happened, wow. end quote. So the Caribou, Caribou County prosecuting attorney stated that Bonnie and Thomas, quote, had been arguing apparently quite violently for quite some time. The weapon used was kept in the bar for alleged security reasons, end quote. And so Bonnie was kept in the Caribou County jail before sentencing, held without bond on first-degree murder charges. Now, Bonnie, I think in the fact that if she kind of truly had this blackout that she's claiming she had, she is kind of already in an emotional and a really tense state and after three days of being held in jail, on July 28th, she actually attempts suicide by slashing her wrists with broken glass. Oh. 
She's first taken to the Caribou County Hospital, but her injuries are so bad that she has to be transferred to the University Hospital in Salt Lake City for surgery. And her injuries are so bad that when she gives her statement upon intake at the state penitentiary, she actually couldn't sign the document with her dominant hand. And so this is, you can see, she had to sign with her, her left hand, and you can see how shaky it is. And that was already, it was injured, as uh, it was just her right was a little bit more injured, so you can see how shaky it is. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting piece uh, that they included on her intake form. And so um, the authorities did allow her to recover before she pleaded guilty to a reduced sentence of voluntary manslaughter. And part of the reason she was allowed to plead for the lesser charge is probably because, according to the judge, quote, there are apparently some unexplained circumstances because of intoxication of defendant and also lack of witnesses, end quote. Which is interesting. I would like to know what John Hoekstra's, like, what his testimony was, like why he didn't have more details of, like, did she just randomly pick it up and shoot in the middle of the argument? Is she, did she truly black out? Are there details she's not telling? I don't know. But actually, even Thomas's family seemed to believe that the shooting was an accident, that she didn't maliciously kill him. Because in his obituary from the Idaho State Journal, it included his marriage to Bonnie, as well as mentioned her children as, as his stepchildren. Mm. And I don't think if they were, they had genuinely thought that she had like maliciously killed him, they would yeah. have included any of that. And they, they just called it an accident. Wow. And so, so it really, to me, seems that, that it was. But she was sentenced to 10 years for voluntary manslaughter, and she entered the Idaho State Penitentiary on August 30th, 1966. So some of her statistics, County Caribou, race white, age 35, birth date, we have that, eyes brown, hair brown, height 66 and a half, so she's about five foot six, weight 132, complexion medium, build medium, no deformities, she is vaccinated, she does drink, she does smoke, she does gamble, she does not do drugs. She was Lutheran, she preferred the Lutheran church, she wasn't a member. She had a a 12th grade education, her occupation was listed as owner of tavern and also bartender. She'd been resident in Idaho for 17 years. I didn't see the most important question there. Yeah. Um, was she a communist? I, that's a good question. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, you never know, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. She, she does seem like the communist type. A little bit. <laughs> um, I don't think that was on this one, actually, which yeah. is too bad. The Herbertillion showed several scars on her legs and even on her face. She had two vaccination scars. She had two surgical scars on her stomach. And then this is interesting. They also noted that both of her ears had been pierced, which is not noted on like any other women's Bertillions. And so I don't know why they felt the need to point this out. I don't know if that wasn't as common back then. I would imagine it was. Like I feel like even way, 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 way back in the day they would have had... (laughs) I don't know. So I thought that was an interesting note. When she joined the women's ward, she joined 11 other women. um, And that included Lula Ann Shreve, who I talked about in the season finale last season, which was really tough. Barbara Ann Singleton was in for her fourth stay, and I talked about her in season two. And then also Sarah Sue Roach, and I talked about her in season three. And then they were actually joined by four more women before the end of the year, and only two left. So by the end of 1966, there were 14 total women out in the women's ward, which is basically its capacity yeah, yeah. so wow. it's pretty pretty tight in there now her time in prison just like most of the women it was pretty low-key um, she did consistently write all of her kids while she was incarcerated they all wanted to be in touch um, with her which I thought was really nice and then the next big document that we have relating to her and her time in prison comes from January 1968 when she placed herself before the Board of Pardons for a commutation of her sentence. And these are remarks from the meeting that, that the authorities wrote. And it says, quote, the victim was her second husband. She had a drinking problem and her husband was an alcoholic. She has three children by her first husband who are now in Nebraska with relatives. Their ages are 17, 16, and 14. Her children need her very much. This is the first time she's ever been away from them. So I guess then it would have been, they would have not moved until she'd been Mm -hmm. incarcerated. Their father hasn't supported them since 1959, and she has always taken care of them. Her parents live in Ainsworth, Nebraska. She plans to go to Fremont, Nebraska. She intends never to drink again. She said none of her family drinks, end quote. So at this meeting, a motion was made to commute her sentence to six years, subject to good conduct. And then in February of 68, she informed the board that her son was graduating from high school in May and she wanted to be released before the fall to, quote, get settled and enter her children in school, end quote. 
Now the problem was that she had to serve one third of her sentence before she could be considered for release. And one third of six years, of course, is two years if my math is right, which I don't even trust that to be we're honest. Historians. But we're historians, so we don't have to do math. <laughs> um, but that means that she wouldn't be released until August 1968, which wouldn't really give her enough time to get back to Nebraska and you know, help her kids settle in. So interestingly, even though her case was not scheduled to go before the next meeting of the board until February 1969, her case was actually reconsidered in April 1968. And her sentence was commuted to five years. So now a third of her sentence was one year and eight months, which is exactly how much she had served. And so Bonnie was discharged from the Idaho State Penitentiary on April 30th, 1968. She did return to her family in Nebraska, and she would remain there for the rest of her life. Um, at some point, probably the early 70s, she married a man named Jean Henney, but I couldn't find a marriage record to verify that year. And the couple lived in Valentine, Nebraska for their whole married life. And the only other definitive record that I could find about Bonnie was from the U.S. Cemetery and Funeral Home Collection, and she passed away on August 2nd, 2013, only five days before her 82nd birthday. Oh. And that is Bonnie Jean Deaton. Wow. Yeah. Nice work, Scott. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. Oh. So, again, I mean, no holdups, no donuts, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, alcohol. I mean, alcohol. If you, you didn't bring any of that, did I, you? Fresh oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, does anybody have a question? about anything we've talked about tonight, or just general about the prison, since we're all or here. Or anything. Yeah. Is this place haunted? <laughs> Probably. Uh, <laughs> we have had a lot of strange paranormal experiences. There were 129 deaths that were documented here. You know, I just talked about two executions that occurred out there. There were six in the Rose Garden, one I sat outside this territorial prison, and then Ray Snowden, of course, the last one up in the gallows. And a lot of people have had strange experiences up there. People have felt scratches. People have been shoved. Uh, my favorite story, actually, in this cell house, a paranormal investigator was up on the top floor. She was peeking into a cell because there's the, the band Deep Purple pasted on the back of this cell. So she's reaching in, trying to take a photo of this band that some prisoner had pasted up there. And she's getting as far as she can. And something ran its fingers through her oh, hair. Nope. And then it whispered, ooh, pretty. Stop. Yeah. I don't know. Might be haunted. I... <laughs> Any other questions? Wait, Anthony, was that just you? <laughs> <laughs> I was hiding. <laughs> I don't think I'd have a job anymore if I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. You just blame it on the ghost. So it wasn't me. What are you talking about? Actually, someone, they, they came in. This is like one of my favorite stories. They came in, and they're like, we were here last week. Took this photo. Of, you can see this apparition of this person. Look at it. And they, like, zoom in. And my coworker's looking at it, and they started laughing. And they're like, why? What, what's up? What's up? That's Anthony. That's, he works here. <laughs> and... <laughs> And it, it was. It was me wearing, like, this orange shirt that, like, why, why would this ghost be wearing an orange shirt? <laughs> it, was, it was fun. Anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah? When did it close? And two, were executions common? And if they were, was it mostly the murders? It's just fascinating to hear a murder. It was more violent. Um, with the first case, the second case was a murder, and she was released in less than two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, we never have executed a woman in the state of Idaho. And again, her charge was reduced to voluntary manslaughter. And, and to be fair, the women did get treated much differently from the men. We had, we've had one, we had one first degree murder and she was really only in for, I think, like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then we had our infamous Lida here. She was in, she was in for longer, um, but she actually was only charged with second degree for various reasons. Um, <laughs> All of the executions were for first-degree murder, and we had 10 total. So they weren't, I mean, I wouldn't say they were overly common. It could be closed in 1973. And so there were just 10 total between 1871 and 1973. So you know all the dates better than I do. Uh, if, can you remember them all off the top of your head right now? Go. 1901, 1904. No, I, I, <laughs> <can't remember. laughs> uh, I mean, Idaho, we just aren't a big capital punishment mm -hmm. state in general. So currently, I think we have eight people on death row. Someone was actually uh, slated to be executed last month, and that got commuted and pushed to November. 
probably it'll just continue to be kicked down the road until he dies of natural causes. We've had three other executions, like I said, since this institution closed, which was 1973, to go off your first question. Uh, December of 1973, the prison closed after 101 years of being active. So. Mm -hmm. And I think there is one woman on death row here in the state, there but is, yeah. um, I don't know if she's scheduled for execution or not. Yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. Her crime was rough, too. Yeah, it's, it's serious. Like, yeah. um, I actually visited the current institution back in the spring. We were like the first visitors to come out there trying to work with the prisoners to provide them an opportunity to sell hobby craft items. Because right now, you know, if you make it a painting or something like that, as soon as you're done, you can't keep it in your cell. So you can't make, you can't knit something nice and keep it in your cell. You got to send it out to family. And prisoners here at this institution, they could actually sell these items in the administration building, which would go on their commissary books. They could just collect it, wait until they leave, and they would have 400 bucks leaving, you know, after making saddles and purses and things. And so we're trying to work with Idaho Department of Corrections to do that again. So we took this huge tour, and it was, it was pretty tense out there because they've had to shut everything down with COVID. And uh, the chief of prisons actually let us go into the chamber, the death chamber, and he walked us through everything. And like, you know, at first he's just like, you know, it looks like a room, but let me explain what this is. And he led us through and it, it ruined my whole weekend. Like mm -hmm. just, and he's talking about the training and that, you know, you have a correctional officer who, you have one who's just completely despondent, won't do anything. You have one that's thrashing around trying to fight them as they're trying to do things. It was just like, it's really heavy. Like yeah. it's not a pretty thing. And yeah, it's a, it's a tough subject to yeah. talk about. And the state has only had two forms of execution. It was hanging mm -hmm. all out here. And mm -hmm. then uh, after there was the, the nationwide sort of moratorium on the death penalty. And then once that uh, went away and it was reinstated in the state, it became lethal injection. Mm -hmm. um, so there, we've never had an electric chair, never had Firing shooting, squad yeah, was firing available, squad. That was yeah, in Utah, I think, is yeah. the only state. Well, not the only, but they did it, state. which yeah. is... I'm glad we didn't do that here. I think people have asked, though, because you'll see holes in the wall and stuff, and people are like, oh, is this firing squad? Mm -hmm. And they're just like, yeah. <laughs> be careful, it might be. Yeah. But <laughs> it's not nice. Oh, well, thank you yeah. all for coming tonight. This has been so much fun. Mm -hmm. You've all been great. Uh, we have, you know, our last thing. Sky, do your own time. Do your own number. All right, everybody. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> Good night, drive safe, have a great weekend. If you enjoyed Behind Gray Walls, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Not only do we get to hear your feedback about the show, but it helps others find us as well. If you're interested in finding out more about the podcast and to see mugshots of the inmates featured in today's episode, follow our Facebook group at Behind Gray Walls Podcast. And we have a podcast Instagram as well. You can find us on Instagram at Behind Gray Walls Pod. <laughs>